up next, uh, I'm excited to introduce our next speaker, Anashua Chatterjee, who will be presenting her keynote titled Visual Technologies Will Help Deliver Quantum Computing. Anashua is an assistant professor at Niels Bohr Institute at the University of Copenhagen. She will share her insights on effective utilization of AI and machine learning tools to analyze visual data to accelerate the development of large scale usable quantum hardware. Take it away, Nashua. Great, thanks very much, Ash. Uh, I'm gonna uh, indeed talk to you today about how we hope that visual technologies will help deliver quantum computing. Uh, I'm an assistant professor. In my group, we work on building uh, quantum processors uh, and I'll just tell you in a little bit what that uh, looks like. This is an aerial view of uh, Copenhagen where we are based. Um, so this is the Center for Quantum Devices. It looks like a pretty uh, complex but standard research lab. However, if you look at these kind of cylindrical uh, uh, structures that we have here, there are experimental apparatus. This is a refrigerator that operates at 0 0.03 Kelvin, where room temperature is around 300 Kelvin, and it's even far colder than the coldest part of our universe. And we built quantum processors, small scale quantum processors, which live inside such a really cold atmosphere. This is such that the really uh, small quantum interactions that uh, are give quantum computing its power don't get decohered by its environment. And so what do I mean by revolutionization of quantum uh, computing? So mainly the idea is that a lot of the you know, the AI and other things that have really revolutionized our life today are driven by the fact that we can now make billions and billions of transistors. You probably have billions on your mobile phone right now. And these are all uh, made up of connections of digital bits. What quantum computing wants to do is instead to make uh, quantum bits where your system, instead of being able to switch between a zero and a one, can in fact have a much larger computational space and that's why we call it a qubit instead of a bit. But the essential problem is the same, that we want to hook these up and make them into billions and billions uh, that you can in one day uh, operate uh, using algorithms. Uh, there are many players in this game worldwide. There's nations, military, there's many uh, heavy hitters as well as many, many startups. Uh, one of the reasons for this is of course that quantum computing seems to have potential to look at uh, quantum cryptography and breaking some cryptography that we use today. However, one of the applications that I personally find very compelling is that uh, we would really like to use this to you know, save the planet, right? So we want to use it for things that can, for example, uh, make it easier for us to make fertilizer, you know, and that might sound a little, you know, non-sexy. However, uh, if you think of the way we make fertilizer right now, which actually drives food production for, you know, the, for global, uh, all countries around the world, uh, we use something called the Haber-Bosch process, which has actually very high temperature and pressure requirements. Um, however, if you can use uh, biocatalysis using uh, some post-quantum uh, systems that are uh, discovered as a result of quantum simulation, you may be able to get away with far lower temperature and pressure requirements. And this actually would make a huge, huge impact. Uh, and that's only one of the many things that it, uh, quantum technologies could revolutionize. But what indeed are these quantum chips that we are making and putting inside our cold environment? Uh, this is actually a 100 nanometer uh, scale bar. So these devices are very, very small. A human hair, the thickness is about you know, 10 micrometers, so about a thousand times bigger than this. And we use these kind of, uh, these are essentially metal uh, voltage carriers, they're electrodes, where each of these you can put a voltage on in order to trap an electron and use its uh, uh, properties as a qubit. And so, as you can see, this is a very complex device and they have gotten more and more complex. Uh, they used to be quite simple. And as a result, what happens is that it becomes very difficult for a PhD student or someone else to tune such a system because these always uh, are tuned and measurements consist of human interpreted 2D raster scans. So what do I mean by raster scan? You change these uh, voltages and you take one point and you keep doing that until you've built up a 2D image that gives you enough information that you can draw some conclusion and keep going. And of course, this is really not scalable if you want to make a billion of these. So um, 
one two applications that I will tell you about and how we use computer vision or uh, let's call it ML or AI. Uh, one of the ways we use the uh, um, AI is that we tried to go from this uh, situation where we acquired such a really beautiful 2D map and then try to understand where the boundaries are because this is where we need to go to load and operate our qubits. Uh, if we care about the boundaries, we don't really need to measure this. So what we did in collaboration with uh, our uh, partners from the computer science department at the University of Copenhagen was to use ML to shoot rays and explore this multidimensional voltage space. Uh, so we were shot shooting out rays instead of measuring uh, a 2D diagram like this. And indeed, the ML was able to cluster these rays in areas where it thought there was more information. And by doing this, we were able to measure um, orders of magnitude faster in 2D and 3D what the charge landscape looks like for our multi-qubit array. So that was really a big improvement. For this measurement, we went from three days to 12 minutes, for instance. The second thing we want to do is to read qubit states very fast. We want to see if the qubit collapses to a zero or a one. And so what we do is this cable coming out here is a signal coming out from the cryostat. But if you look at it with your own naked eye, it looks kind of complex and you won't really understand much. However, if you look at it a little bit more carefully, you'll see that the zero and a one, the two readout outcomes are actually okay to distinguish with your naked eye. So if I color them, you may maybe be able to see that the one seems to have a little bit of a blob here while the zero doesn't. But this is about microseconds of data. If you want to do this very, very fast before your qubit decoheres away, the first 100 nanoseconds are much harder for the human eye, for instance, to recognize. However, a computer can still, a neural network actually, can still distinguish this with about 99% success. And I think this is great. This was really a big Im improvement for us. And it's only one of these ways in which computer vision is, we are applying it to quantum uh, devices. Um, so the dream for us is to have a fully automatically operated quantum processor. We are working with the Danish Pioneer Center for AI, computer science develop, uh, uh, departments around the world. And of course, um, there's uh, the possibility of having uh, a company that focuses on uh, making such a fully automatically operated quantum processor. Thanks very much.